and we'll wait for the attendees to, to come in. Okay. So hello everyone, um, thank you for joining us today for our event entitled Tackling Twin Calamities, Policy, Activism, Art to Combat Climate Change and Nuclear Weapons. This event is sponsored by the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, Zero Hour, New York City, and Bomb Shelter. We also would like to um, highlight this event um, is, is co-sponsored by the permanent mission of Kazakhstan to the United Nations. So I just would like to highlight all of our fantastic speakers that we have for today. Um, we have a wide range of individuals, starting with the ambassador, then Alexander Bell from the Center for Arms Control and Nonproliferation, then um, Milik and Jasmine from the National Nuclear Commission of the RMI, then we have Dr. Ivana Hughes of, Colum of Columbia's K equals one Center for Nuclear Studies, and Phoenix, a member from the West Oakland Environmental Indicators, Ashish Ruli, who's an activist, Runer Wei, who is an environmental um, list fashion designer, and she's a co-founder of Peace Activism, and then Shad McCorder, McCorder, who is a designer and researcher, and has been really looking at the intersection and the relationship between these two subjects. So first, I would like to introduce the ambassador of Kazakhstan to the United Nations, who will provide um, introductory remarks. Yeah. Uh, dear participants, I welcome you to this event and uh, thank you for your commitment to the noble message and purpose of the International Day Against Nuclear Tests. For many of us, especially in Kazakhstan, this topic is very significant and sad and even painful. This tragic page of history will remain with us forever. The consequences of nuclear tests deeply impact human lives and the environment for decades and generations. That is why my country and people have been working incessantly to prevent a similar tragedy with others in the future. Therefore, the leadership of my country has voluntarily chosen a nuclear weapons free plan. We were the first in the world to officially shut down the largest Soviet nuclear test site in Semikolan industry. We also renounced the fourth largest nuclear arsenal in the world and succeeded in creating a nuclear weapon free zone in Central Asia. Furthermore, we proposed to the UN to adopt the Universal Declaration on the Achievement of a Nuclear Weapon Free World. It will also interest you to know that we are party to all existing international treaties on nuclear disarmament and non proliferation, including the latest one, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. We will continue to forge ahead with determination in this direction. Today, for a new generation of millennials, the full implication of nuclear tests and their humanitarian and ecological impact are not thoroughly known. Taking our own example, I want to present the following observations for your consideration. First, uh, let me point out that the consequences of nuclear tests are the most disastrous and long-lasting. We feel them constantly till this present day. In Kazakhstan, one and a half million people have been affected. And for four decades later, imagine four decades later, still suffer from cancer and various genetic mutations. Several hundreds of thousands of square kilometers of Kazakh steppes still remain and will continue to be annihilated and unusable despite huge financial and other resources 
invested in their restoration. Second, the threat of resuming nuclear testing is not as virtual and remote as it seems to many. In the current challenging times, we find that nuclear tests can once again become a real instrument of demonstrating force and military political pressure. Therefore, until the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty enters into force, the specter of nuclear testing will never leave us alone. Third, if, even if some member states decide to conduct nuclear tests in the most distant, so to say, uninhabited corners of the planet, the disastrous impact on the climate is absolutely inevitable. Scientists have long warned us about the scenario of a nuclear winter, as well as the irreparable damage inflicted by nuclear tests. In the current times, when many governments are unable to prioritize the banning of nuclear tests and weapons, civil society and popular movements have a special role to foster new thinking and ways of persuasion in the young generation. If we remember, it was the mass popular demonstrations around the world, such as the grassroots Nevada Semipalarinsk international movement in Kazakhstan, that were at the forefront of action at the end of the 20th century. Their strong stance was the impetus for governments to declare a moratorium on nuclear tests and jointly develop a comprehensive test ban treaty. Unfortunately, what was started is still incomplete. It is necessary to once again demonstrate the strong will of the people, restore their activist trust to further revive concrete and practical activities. Just yesterday at a special meeting of the UN General Assembly, common message were voiced by many delegations about the need to establish a final ban on nuclear tests. This is the first indispensable condition for preventing an uncontrolled new round of nuclear arms. Global leaders and all of humanity must deeply realize that we have one planet, one life, and one chance to save it. It is common, fragile, and unrecoverable in the event of a nuclear apocalypse. First president of Kazakhstan, uh, Nopsultan Nazarbayev, and his address to the participants expressed his belief that, and I quote, the leaders of the United States, Russia, China, and the European Union bear special responsibility for the future of the planet. End of quote. This kind of quadrilateral summit should focus, first of all, on the development of a multilateral agreement on a phased and proportional reduction of nuclear weapons. Kazakhstan once again yesterday expressed its readiness to provide a platform for such a summit. Again, First President uh, of Kazakhstan, Nazarbayev, in his manifesto, the world 21st century proposed to world leaders to declare a war on war and tirelessly strive for a world without nuclear threats. He calls on everyone to rally around this goal since there will not be any winner in this type of war. This requires political will on the part of the nuclear powers. Therefore, at this critical juncture, it is for the young generation and the robust civil society to come forward to play their key role. I appeal to all of you to work closely and persistently with parliamentarians and the governments in this direction. I wish you all a meaningful and substantive discussion and most importantly, practical actions to achieve a world free of nuclear testing and ultimately free of nuclear weapons. I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. So next we will have um, Alexander Bell, who's the Senior Policy Director for the Center for Arms Control and Non-Proliferation. Hi everyone, uh, good afternoon and thanks so much for having me here today. Uh, each year when we mark the International Day Against Nuclear Testing, I think about all the people in the world that have been affected by nuclear testing, uh, many of whom don't get uh, 
thought about a lot in, uh, in policy circles. Uh, and then I think about how it is that we can come together and end nuclear testing once and for all. Uh, it's really been one of the drivers of my career in nuclear policy. I've, I've been to the nuclear test site in Nevada many times and the pockmarked ground there is a really haunting homage to the runaway fear and the madness of the Cold War. And I'm afraid we're moving in that direction again. Uh, specifically at the test site, there's a railroad bridge that was constructed there. So scientists and military planners could see what a nuclear blast would do uh, to a railroad bridge. Uh, the force of the blast uh, that was tested there bent the steel rails on the track uh, into a curve and the rebar burst from the concrete supports, uh, forming these awful metal tentacles reaching out in every direction. There was another person there with me uh, who was also looking at the bridge and they uttered the word incredible. Uh, and I caught the eye of another person there uh, who obviously probably saw my face. It, it wasn't in the, best, uh, in the best shape. And I said, that's not what I would call it. And the person asked me what I would call it. And I said, horrifying. Uh, humans are not made out of reinforced concrete and steel. This isn't an abstract concept. This is human life we're talking about. And when I was serving in government, I was able to visit every state where the US government tested nuclear weapons, Nevada, Alaska, Colorado, Mississippi, New Mexico, as well as the Marshall Islands. I also visited downwind places like Utah. And at all of these places, I, I had the honor of listening to people who were affected by nuclear weapons testing, many of whom are still suffering, uh, many of whom have not received the compensation uh, that they deserve from, from suffering at the hands of the US government. And, and this goes for uh, countries around the world that have suffered nuclear testing, not just the United States. Um, that is why I strive to remind people uh, of when uh, nuclear weapons policies are being discussed, it, it's not theoretical, abstract, you know, three-dimensional chess we're talking about. We're talking about real effects um, and indeed a system of security that's underpinned by the guarantee of death and destruction on a truly unimaginable scale. Uh, the sheer amount of nuclear challenges that we're facing right now um, can seem daunting. And I realize that from internal choices countries are making to proliferate uh, internally, uh, countries considering moving towards a nuclear weapons capability, uh, various regional proliferation challenges, the fact that arms control seems to be crumbling before our very eyes. Uh, I know it seems daunting, but there are things that we can do. There are distinct and necessary tasks like the entry into force of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty that we can work on together, that we can achieve if we're all moving in the same direction. That will require, of course, US ratification of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. Uh, it's something, the political uh, process of that is something I think about a lot. And I really think that we have a strong case to make here in the US, particularly in the wake of recent reports that the Trump administration was considering a nuclear test for demonstration purposes. Uh, that certainly, I, I think, scared people enough to start re-engaging in this conversation, leaders in and around Nevada, understanding that if we don't do something to permanently end nuclear testing, this will constantly be a threat that we're facing. And the two technical factors that really derailed ratification here in the US back in 1999 are no longer issues. This treaty is verifiable and the United States of America does not need to test nuclear weapons in order to maintain a safe, secure and effective nuclear stockpile. Uh, but in order to get that message through the partisan fray, we're really going to need citizens to stand up and speak out and demand action from their leaders. Uh, we need help building support uh, in those states where explosive nuclear, weapon, uh, explosive nuclear testing took place or states that were subject to downwind effects of that testing. This process is going to be tough, no doubt, uh, but it is worthwhile and it is necessary. And of course, other NX tests other Annex two states, um, they don't need to wait for the United States. I like to remind them all the time, nothing is stopping you from going forward with your ratification programs. So the international community and citizens in those countries should be pushing China, India, Pakistan, North Korea, Egypt, Iran, and Israel to go ahead and ratify the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty as well. As long as testing is possible, 
none of us are safe. And as long as testing is possible, we will not have the safeguards in place that we need to safely and eventually eliminate nuclear weapons. So as we mark the International Day Against Nuclear Testing, I hope that, at, that next year, at this time, we will be a little bit closer to ending nuclear testing once and for all. And that will be because the people on this call and people around the world demand that our leaders finally, finally decide that nuclear testing is bad for their countries, it's bad for the world, and it's bad for our future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, next, we are going to focus on the so next, we will focus on the legacy of nuclear testing in the Marshall Islands. So we have um, three presenters. They are um, Malika and Jasmine, who are interns at the National Nuclear Commission of the Marshall Islands, and Dr. Ivana Hughes, who's the director of the K Equal One Project Center for Nuclear Studies at Columbia University. So I propose that first we can hear from the young Marshallese youth who will share their experience and the legacy of nuclear testing in the Marshall Islands. Here's the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Hi, my name is Jasmine Alec. I am a first generation Marshallese American located here in Portland, Oregon, where I was born and raised um, by my two parents who are both Marshallese immigrants. First off, I wanna thank NAP NAPF and the sponsors for having us today, for giving us this platform to share our stories about, um, although it's, we're a small island, so this is affecting everyone. Um, currently, just some background, I'm a student at the University of Washington, pursuing my master's in public health. And as Christian mentioned, I'm also an intern with the Marshall Islands National Nuclear Commission. This is where I've been learning majority of the details regarding my nuclear legacy, as I did not hear any of this in my public school system. Mostly it was just from stories from my family. Um, but now I'm really starting to learn the truth and I'm looking forward to share some of this information with you today. Uh, hi, my name is Malika, and I'm also an intern with um, National Nuclear Commission with Jasmine. And it's been such a really great experience just um, learning about our nuclear history because just as Jasmine said, we don't learn about it in school. and. Um, it also gave me the opportunity to participate in conversations like this, where I can learn about other um, communities that are impacted by this global issue. So thank you for also having me here. For time's sake, we're just going to go over the Marshall Islands nuclear history like very briefly. A lot happened and we are still living through the aftermath today. So this will just be a really quick snapshot overview. Um, we wanna just highlight today the overlaps between nuclear history and climate change as this is also a very big topic today. Um, so we're just gonna briefly give some context around both and then highlight the overlaps. Um, overall, in the Marshall Islands, there were 67 tests conducted over the 12 years in the 40s and 50s. And this is not including the many other toxic war weapons that were tested also on the islands that included like testing out different gases and whatnot for warfare. And those were also very toxic to the surrounding environment. Overall, all the, the overall impact of all the tests together is equivalent to as if you were to drop a bomb that was the same size as the one dropped in Hiroshima every single day for 12 years, just to give an idea. The US chose to conduct these tests in the Marshall Islands because it is far away from the US, it is isolated in the Pacific Ocean, and it's away from anyone watching. So no one will know what was happening. Um, a lot of this information was classified and no one was allowed to share about it. Um, so that's why we are still learning a lot of information today. Uh, these tests, caused many Marshleys to be displaced from their homes, as shown in this picture is a, a 
a boat that was transferring the Marshall people from one island to another, as a lot of the tests were tested <laughs> directly on their home islands or the radioactive fallout would blow onto nearby islands from the winds. Um, to this day, many families don't live on their home islands as it is still not safe to live in. And then some islands, families have moved back, although it is still not safe. Um, there still hasn't been a lot of information that has been disclosed to the Marshallese population saying that it is not safe. So a lot of things we're still figuring out today. Another um, opportunity the U.S. saw this as was an opportunity to do human experimentation to see how radiation affects the human bodies. They call this Project 4.1, where they really just documented how it affected their health and then also the natural environment surrounding. Um, they were tested on two islands specifically, the populations there, Rongalup and Wuluruk. And then they used the capital island, Mayuro, as a control, just to compare and contrast. As of today, the islands are not fully cleaned up. The U.S. just kind of stopped that. And right here on the bottom right picture shown is the Runet Dome that lies on Inouyeduk Island. And this is where it's basically a huge dump site where they put in all of the radioactive waste. As of today, it is leaking and is seeping into our oceans where it's starting to seep more radioactive and more tox toxic waste affecting our waters, our fish, our coral, our natural resources. Uh, as of climate change, also is a very big topic. We're gonna just do a really brief overview um, on how it's affecting the Marshall Islands specifically. Um, as you can see on the top right picture is a picture of one of the islands. It's a very, the Marshall Islands are low lying atolls and very thin islands. The highest point is just two meters, like six feet above sea level. So when there are high tides or king tides, it easily covers the entire island intruding to people's homes and whatnot. A lot of the climate change effects also resonate along with the nuclear testing effects, such as the um, warming of the waters and killing of the coral. Uh, climate change and nuclear testings, there is a lot of overlap than not. Even though they seem like very different topics, there, is, there are a lot of similarities. Um, just to go over these pictures that we've added on the bottom right picture is them building a seawall which is kind of like just a wall up kind of bordering around your house, just in preparation of king tides, high tides, so that it doesn't go into your property, into your homes. And then as you can see on the bottom left picture, a lot of our grave sites are along the coast and they're starting to be washed away from the rising sea levels. Uh, so Jasmine um, went through most of, like the nuclear history, but the Marshall Islands has been a war zone, um, Pacific proving ground. They've been a dump site and they are right now with the Runet Dome and now just one of the frontline communities more vulnerable to climate change. And meaning it might begin with us and other communities, but it doesn't end there. And so when we're talking about nuclear testing and climate change in the Marshall Islands, it's hard to talk about one and not the other because they're two connected issues. So we have like this Venn diagram set up of all the similarities of these issues and radiation and climate change, you can't physically see the poison and greenhouse gases, but you can physically see and feel the damages it's causing. So they're both human made accelerated problems. The U.S. military presence since World War II has been doing most of that damage for us and because we didn't partake in the testing there was little to no information about the realities of their work and um, their work was never revealed until later. So radiation and climate change they're like created enemies and all trying to work 
against nature. It's not natural. Um, whenever I hear climate change isn't real, I think that's like a certain privilege in, um, on my side of the Pacific Ocean. So I'm in Washington. I don't see any of those uh, climate change effects, but when I go to the other side and I visit home Marshall Islands, everything is different. Like every time I visit, the water gets warmer, the, the air gets warmer. Um, there's waves that are getting rougher. The sea walls are getting higher. The runet dome is still leaking. And there's insect-borne diseases that have been on the rise. So like Zika virus. And the last summer I was there, they also had dengue fever. Um, climate change isn't a conspiracy theory. It's a battle that future generations globally will have to face if people have the mentality of it's not real because I can't see it from here. And so the testing of 67 plus nuclear bombs dispersed radiation all throughout the Marshall Islands and even to neighboring islands. Radiation is deeply rooted into our oceans, damaging marine life, land, from food to essentials we relied on for our way of living. And the Bikini Atoll to this day is uninhabitable and it caused forced migrations for the Bikinians. Radiation is also rooted through passing genes. Um, after the testing area, Marshallese people, um, that's when they first started developing cancer. They never had it before the testing. And these are all changes that last forever. Um, Sorry. Um, and so this can continue heavily if we really do decide to go with more nuclear testing and in further pushing up that trend of climate change. And I think um, for the two main issues that we're talking about today, I see hope just in listening to all the activists and their different ways of um, advocating through their art, uh, policy changing, educating, um, it's just pushing change and also um, guiding others that aren't in the light about nuclear testing and climate change because um, participating in this webinar, you're a participant and a viewer. And so it's always like a learning thing on here. And yeah, so taking on um, another like hope that I see is in us youth where we'll be learning and taking on the torches of from leaders who have worked hard to advocate for a healthier world. Climate change isn't new um, and it's not a quick fix, but we'll need global action for change. Thank you, Jasmine and Malika so much. Um, maybe we'll save the questions for towards the end and I'll just address a couple of things. Um, I really do feel very inspired to hear from young leaders. Uh, that is one of the things that I have uh, worked very hard at uh, Columbia University to really engage and, and this builds on the words um, of uh, the ambassador. Thank you so much for your for your inspiring words and, and also Ms. Bell. Um, the idea that we really, really need the younger generation to not only become aware um, of just how um, dangerous nuclear weapons are, how important these nuclear uh, technology issues are, but really to lead the path forward. Um, at Columbia over the last uh, several years, we basically became interested in what happened in the Marshall Islands, both as a sort of opportunity to perhaps help uh, right a historical wrong, uh, and, but also to understand things about nuclear weapons and the way in which they could affect us at present and into the future. And I can tell you from the scientific perspective, so our goal really was to go in and, and learn um, about the radiological conditions that are present now many decades later. So. 
Um, it has been um, over 65 years now since the Bravo, the infamous Bravo test, uh, which happened in 1954 and which in and of itself was a thousand times more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb. And this is of course the test that Jasmine and Malika were referring to of that the spread so much fallout, not only um, onto Bikini Island, which had been inhabited prior to the testing, but also to neighboring islands where people were living at the time. Um, and I can tell you from the scientific perspective that what Jasmine had in her slide is absolutely um, dead on correct. That island is not ready to be resettled people still cannot go there. And one of the things I find especially heartbreaking is that as the Marshall Islands is confronting the issue of climate change, Bikini Island happens to be one of the highest lying islands. It could be one of the islands that, that is least impacted by climate change, and yet it's not inhabitable because the radiation levels simply are too high. They they simply violate all sorts of uh, limits and, and guidelines uh, for radiation uh, presence, uh, in particular in the food, but from other sources as well. So again, just to underscore the point, we need the young people involved in this, and we need the lessons from the Marshall Islands and Kazakhstan and Nevada and, and really throughout the world um, the, to, to recognize that these are not just things that happen and they're then over with, but they do really have la long lasting effects. Um, and uh, we need to right the historical wrongs, um, but also make sure that this doesn't happen in the future. So thank you to Christian for organizing this and for, for including me. Um, and the Marshall, our young Marshallese leaders in this discussion. Um, thank you so much. And I thought it was a very powerful presentation. And we'll do Q&A at the end of the webinar. Um, shifting gears, we're going to focus now on um, activism. Um, sorry, we're going to focus on environmental activism. So we have a really great um, panelist. Their name is Phoenix Love Amarty, and who is an artist, activist, and environmental justice organizer living in Oakland, California. They have worked on environmental, racial, and social justice campaigns around the world, including anti-nuclear organizing in, Indi in Japan and India, homeless advocacy in San Francisco, and multiple civic engagement and political campaigns throughout the Bay Area. They will also be um, presenting a um, short presentation by Ashish Ruli, an activist from India, who unfortunately, because of um, connection um, issues, will be unable to join us, but has prepared a statement that will be read. So Phoenix, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me here today. Again, my name is Phoenix Armenta. Uh, I'm a climate justice organizer based in Oakland, California. So this week in Oakland, we are experiencing the worst air quality in the world as fires rage all around us throughout California. Uh, many of us have been told to prepare a go bag in case we need to be evacuated, and many of my friends have suddenly become climate refugees. For those of us who've been working on these issues, it is obvious that the effects of climate change are bearing down on us. The urgency of action cannot be understated. It is imperative that people around the world start changing their consumptive patterns that have led us to an increasingly warmer world. In addition to the fires, Oakland is faced with toxic, toxic chemicals, a, his, a legacy of businesses and military that have left uh, toxins all across our shoreline in our low-income communities. Uh, these, this is uh, this is a result of our extractive economy that has seen that we have taken from the Mother Earth, we have used our, uh, we have used its resources to make various technologies that have had several negative comp uh, consequences, and we have forced low income and indigenous communities to be the main brunt of those people who are bearing those consequences. This is true with nuclear technology as well. So in nuclear technology, when you're talking about nuclear weapons or nuclear power, that people are hurt from the moment of extraction to the moment of detonation. So in my experience, I've had the opportunity to live in Hiroshima, Japan. 
uh, where I met several people who were affected from the, the original bomb, first bombing of your nuclear weapons. Uh, talking to these folks about their experiences, uh, horrifying. That's really the only statement you can say. And once you've heard these stories, you really know you, you, you don't want this to happen to anyone else in the world. Unfortunately, it is happening all across the world through nuclear testing, through uranium mining, uh, in my experience working in Hiroshima, I was able to meet activists and organizers from all over the world dealing with the, the nuclear fuel cycle in different areas. One of those was working with uh, the residents of Jatagoda, India, where I met Ashish Barili several, several years ago. In Jatagoda, uh, they are indigenous to India. Uh, if you know, 90% of uranium mines are on indigenous land. And even though they are uh, dealing with supplying a large portion of the material for the nuclear weaponry and nuclear energy in, in India, they are very poor and they, they don't get any of the uh, positive effects of this at all. They, uh, they have issues with electricity in their community in spite of the fact that they're uh, supplying for nuclear energy. And uh, they have uh, multiple, uh, uh, effects uh, such as cancers and birth, birth defects in their whole community. Uh, I want to read from Ashish Burili's presentation so you can get a little bit of understanding of what they are dealing with then. So he says, currently India has 22 nuclear reactors with a total capacity of 6.7 megawatts, which supplies only 3.22% of India's electricity. India plans to increase nuclear energy by 27.5 gigawatts by 2032 which means that there would be more exploration of uranium mining in India for import of uranium from other countries. The place where I live is called Jadagoda, which is home to the India's first uranium mining in India since 1967. For the last 53 years, a total of three tailing ponds have been constructed where lethal radioactive waste is dumped and is just 500 meters away from my home. We are living very next to the dumping yard of dangerous uranium waste. Presently, indigenous people of Jatagoda affected by are suffering from various health problems, not just people, but has also affected the air, water, and its biodata diversity of the local as well as local people of fighting against these happenings. But the government continuously denies the fact that radiation is dangerous. The whole world knows how dangerous ra radiation is and nuclear weapons, but the government of India does not accept it. The root cause of all these nuclear problems is rootly connected with uranium mining, and I request for support for everyone to put pressure on the Indian government not to continue with uranium mining anymore. Lots of anti-nuclear activists are be have been put with sedition charges, which according to the Indian government means fighting against uranium mining and nuclear weapons and an act of anti-nationalism and terrorism. We all need your support. So in my work, we believe that when you help the most vulnerable in the communities, you help all people. And as we say, an injury to one of us is an injury to all, and there's no way that we can go forward with nuclear technology and not hurt all of us. I mentioned that many of my friends have become climate refugees, and we know that in the future, there are gonna be more and more climate re refugees. We can expect that there's gonna be uh, some resources that are scarce, and that there could be conflict over those resources. And unfortunately, it seems very plausible that those conflicts can be, would be fought with nuclear weapons. We cannot afford to live in an irradiated world. Uh, radiation from Fukushima made it to, to my city. Depleted uranium that has been dumped in, in, the Gulf, in the Persian Gulf has made it all around the world. It's time for us all to join together to start fighting for the elimination of nuclear weapons. Uh, I, I'm working locally and I'm connecting to people all around the world and I'm, I'm grateful for this opportunity to connect to all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your, um, for, for the presentation and also for sharing Ashish's um, presentation as well. Um, next, we're going to transition towards um, activism through the arts. So we have two really wonderful um, environmentalists, researchers, fashion designers. First one is Runa Ray, who's an Indian-born fashion environmentalist and documentary designer who has worked extensively with climate action and has been involved in several projects with the, um, with the United Nations. 
And she's really been like very committed to like reason, re using art and fashion as a means of raising awareness. So please, Runa, if you could um, go first, and then I will introduce um, Charlotte. Hello. Hi, everyone. Am I audible? Yes, you are. OK. First of all, thank you so much. I would like to thank the Nuclear Age uh, Peace Foundation, Bomb Shelter, Zero R NYC, the permanent representative of Kazakhstan to the United Nations, Mr. Kairat Umrav, distinguished guests and other members of the panel. I'm Runa Ray, I'm a fashion environmentalist, and I've always used art to, as activism to educate the public and advocate for policy change. I'm gonna start a shared screen right now, which will, one second, yeah. Okay, so now the slides that I'm going to be sharing is the kind of work that I've done where I've used art as activism. Uh, climate change is one of the most defining issues of the moment from rising sea levels, shifting weather patterns and unprecedented flooding. Climate change is global in its scale. As a person concerned with the environment, I've always used fashion as a medium to educate and help people to make better choices for the planet. My involvement with fashion and the environment started more than a decade ago. It was where I advocated for climate action and used art through public interaction and public exhibits to engage with people and help them understand the social, environmental, and political challenges and help them and get them to commit to peace and justice. For me, Every little action for the environmental justice was a step in the right direction. My displays of origami depicting zero stitch clothing, which negated carbon footprint of the machines and the exhibitions at the United Nations focusing on the SDGs 13 and 14, the pictorial representation of the bleeding flowers destroyed forests at the New York Fashion Week managed to raise awareness and help amplify climate change. This activation for climate, for the climate, ultimately led me to interlace humanity, peace, and the environment. Because ultimately, if you look at it, climate change and nuclear war are extraordinarily interlinked. With countries having their own nuclear weaponry, any conflict that arises from climate change due to food and water supplies dwindling, will have governments come under ever increasing pressure to meet the vital needs of their population. And this can set off a nuclear war in uncertain circumstances, giving the tensions that could arise from such situations. Systemic racism and discrimination is also linked to the environment. Environment racism is rampant where marginalized people, low income countries and communities of color are disproportionately impacted by polluting industries. It is these interlinkages that make us see the concerns of nuclear war climate change, and environmental prejudices as a whole. It was then when I started the dialogue, which is a platform for social and environmental concerns, a platform where people could have their voices heard world over. As a nonprofit, my organization uses art in all its forms to encompass a diverse range of human activities and ways of expression, including music, film, literature, sculptures, and paintings where we invite people of different spheres of society to partake in art and its expression towards peace. One example was where we created a video where we had people in the fashion industries of different faiths working on different garments. And the question that arose was, it is a Muslim dyer and a Hindu tailor, and would you still wear it? Would you still wear the garment made by people of different faiths without knowing that they made it? Another part of the, uh, another example of my fashion activism was when I traveled last year to Kashmir during the lockdown with a hand paint, painted kaftan to the uh, Indo-Pakistan Indo border. India and Pakistan are nuclear countries that have been in trigger mode for, for decades. And it is suggested that even a limited war between the two could cause unprecedented 
planet-wide food shortages and probable starvation lasting more than a decade. Experts have long regarded Pakistan and India the most dangerous players because of their history of near continu continuous violent uh, conflict over territory and other issues. It was here where I presented my token of peace. It was basically the Indo uh, it was the national flower of India, which is the lotus, which you see on the right. And then you had the national flower of Pakistan, which was the jasmine that you see on the left. And the kaftan is a common garb that is worn by both the countries. And this is what I presented over the barbed wire that actually separated India and Pakistan. And here you can see the me standing with the border guards. And I think the garment was very, very well accepted. This is again the garment on the barbed wire where you can see the partition of the two countries, which is really, really touching and extremely sad to be a part of this entire scenario. Art, this is a wall for, at the United Nations, the Berlin Wall. And the reason I'm showing you is uh, because you can use art in different forms because art can evoke in you different emotions depending on its expression. And it's also important in its non-verbal communication. It can help greatly in public campaigns and general awareness, raising and instilling beliefs and values of, of a sustainable society. We must harness its power to mobilize and inspire people, to multiply its initiative, and help amplify the impact it has for tackling the twin calamities. I would like to conclude by saying that the risk of nuclear war grows as long as nuclear armed states are threatened by climate change. We cannot slow global warming without slowing down the nuclear arms race. Nuclear war and climate change are interlinked, and it's important that peace activists and climate activists work together for joint campaigns. It is only by uniting our efforts in joint campaigns for survival that we can triumph over the destructive forces of these twin calamities, and to use art as activism and advocate for policy change. I personally feel that if the governments put in more money into healthcare and their people rather than the military, we would be waging more peace than the war that's constantly waging. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Runa. So next we will have an, a final speaker before we go into um, Q and A is Charlotte Toder, who is an award-winning interdisciplinary designer and researcher who works at the intersection of technology featuring an existential threats. Her work on carbon negative materials after ancient sunlight debuted as part of nature, the Cooper Hewitt design triennial fast, and, the fast, and the fast company selected as the winner in experimental, um, experimental category in the 2019 Innovation by Design Awards. And her work has been featured in numerous um, publications, newspapers, including the New York Times, The New Yorker, The Guardian, Wallpaper, BuzzFeed, and beyond. And she's based here in New York City. So please, Charlotte, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Christian. You're overselling me. Um, it's a really a privilege, privilege to speak after so much expertise and lived experience. And I'm going to try to use my time to talk a little bit about what a designer could bring to the table on such entrenched problems. Um, I really appreciate what Runa just went through in terms of highlighting the way in which climate change and nuclear weapons are like, they are the fuse for the other and they are, it's totally intertwined. But I want to talk a little bit more about what makes them similar. Um, they're sort of, you probably have heard them described as wicked problems. They're fundamentally similar in certain ways. But they're also similar in the way that we've been trying to approach them in a broad sense, in that we can see in both problems that reciting facts and describing apocalyptic scenarios has not worked to sufficiently catalyze public action. They're also similar in that they are both characterized by a fair amount of expertise and gatekeeping through language. It's very difficult as a non-expert to feel like you have the authority to have an opinion and a point of view on what kind of future you want to build in these problem spaces. And I think the fourth point I want to make about what makes them similar has been highlighted so well by the Marshallese youth leaders we've already heard from, that we often talk about both these issues as existing distal in time, that they're either in the future or in the past, but actually they're both disasters that are already here, just unevenly distributed. 
So designers, why could a designer help on these problems? A designer is someone who makes abstractions concrete. We've heard already the problem of abstraction. Malika highlighted that being able to hold these challenges as abstractions is a privilege, in fact. And so how to make them concrete and meaningful. Design is work of meaning making, making it meaningful. My favorite part of being a designer is being in a position to translate expertise, um, which we've heard plenty of and looking at the participants in this thread, there's a lot of experts as well. Um, design is a technique of asking why and asking why of the answer and asking why of that answer and trying to understand the fundamental assumptions behind these status quos we've built. And design as a technique for holding onto in a really tangible way and experimenting with the contingency of the status quo we live, live in. It's a way of seeing how everything that has been invented can be reinvented or made obsolete. Um, so how do we wage peace on issues that, that currently face public paralysis like climate change and nuclear weapons? I would propose to this group of people that waging peace on issues where people already are afraid and which for the majority of countries, majority of their citizens are currently keyed in that climate change, for instance, is an active threat. How do we wage peace? It's not from a lack of information. In my work, my, the hypothesis I work on is that what is keeping people paralyzed is uh, an apocalypse fatigue. There's so much to, to give empathy to and to fear. Um, there's a cognitive dissonance in an issue like climate change and nuclear weapons of being told you're complicit, that you are part of the problem and you are a bad person therefore, and your unwillingness to give up your standard of living or your security from your infrastructure is what makes you part of the problem. That turns people off and makes them turn away from the issue. And then often solutions are framed in ways that emphasize that which is currently not working and therefore they're framed in a way that trigger loss aversion because people are being told they have to give up what they've come to know and change is terrifying on its face to humans, to the little mammals that we are. So what I pursue in my work, and um, Christian alluded to this, I work on work with carbon negative materials to create charismatic objects from a future where we've fully decarbonized our society. In particular, um, I've made a raincoat out of a plastic I developed that's made out of algae that's carbon negative, and it creates a really tangible, concrete way to imagine yourself in a future that is still beautiful, it's still full of self-expression, it's still full of the ability to give a gift but we're totally uh, divested from our fossil fuel infrastructure. So the hypothesis I pursue in my work is that positive prototypes of livable futures that are developed in collaboration with experts so that they're really sound, they're really plausible, that these kinds of prototypes create an opportunity to get people who already understand but are not yet activated to invest in an issue. So I've been asked to throw a question to the audience. Um, since I'm wrapping up here. And my question to you is what gives you resilience? What in the face of everything else that's going on right now gave you the energy to come here and extend your compassion to two more issues, climate change and nuclear testing, nuclear weapons. And I, I, what I wanna challenge you on is to see if part of what keeps you showing up and helps you show up on issues like this is a positive formulation that you know that every inch we cover today is a life, is a right, is a well-being of a real person tomorrow. And that's my question is, what gives you the resilience to do this work? Thanks, Christian. Thank you so much. So now we will open up the floor and have um, Q&A with all of our you know, great attendees. Um, Please, um, I think, you know, as we have one question um, by Thomas Nordberg, and then um, we can go into um, Sean's question about reuse, about what makes you resilient. And um, please, if um, Thomas um, Nordberg, if you could um, ask a question, or if you would like me to read it.
and I have enabled you to um, um, talk if you would like to um, present your question. Yes, yes, I was wondering if it's possible to devise a global campaign for countries to join the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty? Who would like to answer that question? Um, perhaps um, Alex or the Yeah, ambassador. I'd be happy to. And, and of course can defer to the ambassador, but uh, I would say um, I'd like to see a, a regional approach. I think uh, obviously any deal with North Korea, uh, North Korea, a serious deal, an actual verifiable, well thought out, well negotiated deal with North Korea should include uh, a session to the CTBT. Uh, sometimes people say North Korea would be the last country to ratify or what if they were the last one. I, th I think that's a high class problem. So I think we can think about that issue separately. Uh, I think the United States needs to show leadership and go ahead and, and move on ratification. It's in our national security interests. It's in our uh, interest to have nuclear testing ended around the world. So I think the U.S. should move forward on its own, at which point I think uh, a regional approach, for example, China, India, Pakistan, uh, moving together to ratify uh, the same in the Middle East with Egypt, Israel, and Iran. Uh, you know, I think there are a lot of creative ideas. I think the leadership coming out of CTBTO has been really strong, and the expansion of the IMS system has given people reason uh, beyond just the testing detection capabilities. The overall scientific marvel that is the IMS system is worth preserving just on its own. But uh, I think there's a good case to be made that we can we can look at these kind of groupings of states that still remain. And honestly, like I said, it, it requires public pushing. Uh, so often I hear, I deal with Congress all the time, and I constantly hear from staff on the Hill and even members that they just don't hear from their constituents about nuclear issues. They don't hear uh, that testing is an issue. And the difference I think recently has been in the wake of the, the reports of the Trump administration talking about testing, uh, members of Congress and staff were getting calls from constituents being like, what is going on here? And that really had an effect. And you saw a lot of movement on Capitol Hill uh, to, to move against any sort of Trump move to, to pursue a nuclear test. And the, and the overall reintroduction of the conversation up there, but it really was constituent driven and that's what we're gonna need in the United States and around the world. I just would like to add, uh, and I agree very much with Alexander when she was saying that we need a more, um, uh, more activism uh, on, and more pressure on the Senate if we take US for example, uh, because in the Senate uh, actually nothing is moving uh, regarding the nuclear issues. And this is uh, a frozen issue for the U.S. Senate. And if we uh, can really, uh, I mean, not we, but uh, the uh, NGOs and uh, public could really write letters and start lobbying their senators, talking about the necessity for CTBT to be in the force, I think that could be a change. Uh, when we're talking about CTBT, uh, uh, how we can really make it working uh, and how we can uh, start this international campaign, why, what are the reasons for that? I should say that until the CTBT is really uh, becoming working, we have a loophole, loophole for countries to really test and venture into uh, nuclear testing because there is no any instrument which can prohibit them from doing that. And it is in the interest of all the countries, especially those like US, India, Pakistan, to have this agreement in place in order not to allow other countries to venture into this kind of business. And if all countries really join in and get CTBT working, then all of us can pressure North Korea or other countries who would like to have nuclear weapons or, or start nuclear testing. It, it's, it's already a movement. It's already a pressure. It is already an opportunity for all of us to really put those guys uh, to be accountable uh, before the international community. Without this, 
I don't see any other ways for us to be successful in our campaign uh, to stop nuclear testing. And you know that nuclear testing is the first step towards having a nuclear weapon. So, uh, or modernizing, better to say, uh, modernizing the nuclear weapons. Uh, that's why I think that we need really more activity uh, shown by the people talking about this, uh, making evident that we should eliminate any possibility for any countries really do this kind of testing on their own territories. Uh, the whole event today was talking against the nuclear test and you saw yourself uh, how important for us to really deal with that issue. So I think that there is enough arguments for us to start working on this issue. Uh, so thank you very much for giving us the chance to speak about it, but without that, uh, I don't see uh, that we can be successful. It, your voices, your uh, real commitment to that issue could make things different. Because I was ambassador in uh, Washington for uh, four years before coming to the UN, and I would say uh, it is very difficult to deal with uh, the Senate uh, in, in, in Washington because they uh, really don't feel any pressure, they don't hear any voices, and they just, it's, it's not on their agenda. And only through the public activism, I think today something could be changed. The moment the United States starts moving on that issue, I think the rest of the countries will join in because everyone is watching how U.S. will behave. And that could be the uh, very critical moment for uh, uh, the CTBT to become effective. So that's what uh, I think is the way for young people to really start the campaign, really start urging, uh, working with their governments uh, to show the political. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have, there's a question from for Alex. I know Alex, you have to leave very soon. Um, the question is, um, you noted that one of the experiences you made this issue real for you is seeing the Nevada test site. Can you speak more about this, ex this experience and ways to bridge theoretical policy work happening in DC with the lived experiences in the rest of the US? Absolutely, uh, I, I don't think there's any uh, way to duplicate for the personal experience. It, it's not only in Nevada, going to the Marshall Islands um, just was, was an absolutely eye-opening experience for me. And in fact, uh, one of the speakers mentioned king tides. Uh, while I was there on Majro, uh, while I was sleeping, the entire atoll was underwater. Uh, I just happened to be in a, in a room up on stilts and it, you know, just brought to bear the very real uh, effects of climate change and but then also actually going and seeing um, the islands like Kili where we put uh, displaced Bikini Islanders uh, you know really putting them in a place that that's hard for them to access very isolated uh, you know it, it, things that I think that people in DC don't think about when they make choices and you know it's like I said all theoretical and on pieces of paper um, out at the test site the first time I went actually it was with a group of men I was the only woman uh, and I saw the Sedan Crater for the first time where we had done this uh, underground explosion uh, to do sort of sea earth movement. Um, could we, you know, build harbor stands, et cetera, and this sort of crazy idea we had called Project Plowshares. And I saw the Sedan Crater and I just, tears started welling up in my eyes. But of course I'm with a bunch of men. So I was, I was concerned that, you know, am I gonna look soft in here? And I was like, no, this is, this is the kind of horror that I hope that people will never have to experience again. I, I've been to Hiroshima, I've been to Nagasaki. Uh, I, I cannot tell you how much, you know, some of the images there still haunt me every day. I try to get senators, staff, members of Congress to go on delegations, to go to these various places and, and see the very human effects. And, and like I said, I, I never want to see the disconnection of, of what it is that nuclear weapons can do and, and these kind of, you know, ivory tower discussions that we have sometimes uh, in Washington and very Geneva, Vienna, where we, we kind of talk about it in this very sort of anodyne, uh, sterile way. And I was like, no, this is, this is very real. And, and this, will, 
is, you know, it's quite literally an existential threat. The two existential threats facing this world are nuclear war and climate change, and we're not doing enough on either. And they're both preventable. We can stop these things. We can change our fate. But again, and I, I know it sounds like a broken record, but that'll really only happen when people really stand up and engage and demand their leaders uh, choose a different path, choose a di different direction. We don't have to you know, keep going down this road where we're going to burn our world up either via nuclear weapons or via climate change. Thank you. And I believe um, Jackie Cabasso has a question to ask. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so uh, Alexander and I have already had a little bit of dialogue going, but I was saying that as one of the people that you're appealing to to advocate for a comprehensive ratification of the CTBT, which I have done since uh, the late 1980s, um, you're also saying that we should be using the argument that the U.S. doesn't need to test in order to maintain a safe, secure, and reliable stockpile. And I say that asking us to make that point now is asking us to walk away from our commitment to disarmament. And I'm also asking you to address the, the very problematic nature of the fact that the United States decided to compensate for the loss of full-scale underground nuclear tests by putting in place this very expensive, elaborate lab-based and uh, supercomputer-based program called Stockpile Stewardship which not only allows the U.S. to maintain its nuclear weapons, but also to develop modified and novel nuclear weapons, including the W-84 air-launched cruise missile and W-87-1, both under development at Livermore Lab. W-87-1 actually requires an entirely new plutonium pit, and all of the other nuclear-armed states have initiated their own lab-based modernization programs. So stockpile stewardship is not benign, and its challenges must be addressed as part of this discussion. We cannot make the mistake that was made in 1996 when the arms control community decided to be silent on the question of replacing underground testing with other means. Uh, thanks for your question, Jackie. Um, I spend a lot of time uh, working on uh, modernization issues in, in Washington. I'm not unaware uh, that the Trump administration uh, and administrations before have used stockpile stewardship program in a way to potentially advance uh, the technical capabilities of, uh, of certain warheads. Um, the United States is not gonna unilaterally disarm. We're not going to, period. And, uh, and I am not the only one with an opinion in Washington. There's a complete other side of the argument uh, that quite frankly thinks we should build nuclear weapons, we should test nuclear weapons. Uh, maybe we should even use nuclear weapons. Those people exist in Washington too. Uh, it is the general consensus that the United States will maintain a safe, secure, and effective stockpile for as long as nuclear weapons exist. It has also been a long-standing principle, except for with this administration, that the United States will pursue in good faith disarmament measures. We have not always lived up to that standard, and I, I think it's something that we should work harder on. It's something that I hope future administrations will do to reclaim American uh, leadership on uh, disarmament issues. Uh, but uh, we will not get to a nuclear weapons free world without a verifiable ban on nuclear testing. Uh, and the, so the, the path to zero goes straight through a test ban. The countries that have joined the nuclear test ban, comprehensive nuclear test ban treaty support it. Uh, they want the annex two states to join it. They're well aware that those states have modernization programs. They do not think the CTBT doesn't have value because of it. Uh, so I, you know, we've got to deal with the problems that we have in distinct pockets and, and not expect a, a grand bargain and everything we want every time. I, I think the CTBT is international security interest. It's in the national security interests of the world. Uh, and I think the path to ratification in the U.S., unfortunately for, you know, people uh, who don't support the program, it, it, it's an essential part of getting ratification in the United States. Um, and like I said, we're not unilaterally disarming. We just won't. So uh, these step-by-step -step, uh, achievements that we can make, um, I think it's the road to zero. I, I know not everybody agrees, but uh, what I'd very much like to see is a permanent end to nuclear testing. The Trump administration's moves uh, recently to talk about a demonstration test, I, I think is truly scary. And I hope it woke people up to the idea that we have not dealt with this problem and the only way we can do it is through a global enforced CTBT. 
Yes, thank you. And I know, Alex, you have to leave. I do have to go. I thank you so much, everybody, for joining. And Ambassador, it's an honor to be here with you. And, and thanks to Nuclear Age Peace Foundation uh, for putting this on. Thank, thank you. you. We will continue the discussion. Thank you so much, Alex. So um, next, I see that there's a question from um, Helen Young to the Marshallese youth. Helen, I'm going to enable. Um, yes, please, Helen. Uh, yeah, I just had a quick question for Malika and Jasmine. I was a little, I was taken aback when you said that uh, in the public schools, uh, the, the students are not told about the legacy of nuclear testing at the Marshall Islands. And I was just wondering why that was. Had efforts been made to include it in the curriculum? It's part of your history after all. Um, so I, grew up in Washington and here in the States, I don't really expect them to um, give me a history lesson about uh, the nuclear testing, but actually it's interesting because in the Marshall Islands, um, part of NNC, we have Ariana Tibun and she is the education awareness coordinator and um, she was able to get the nuclear history into the curriculum. I think it was about two years ago and I think the reason that it hasn't been like in discussion is just that after the testing, nobody really talked about it. It wasn't something that I grew up hearing about from my parents just because it wasn't a topic that we um, just discussed during dinner time. But I think it's so important that the youth start to learn more about our nuclear history because it's just slowly getting forgotten and the voices and stories of and testimonies of our elders that had to witness those in person, it's going to get lost. But yeah, especially here in the States, a lot of, um, there's a lot of Marshallese people in the States and students, we don't learn about it either. So um, just like finding a community and places to be able to talk about it has been what's worked for me. And um, in the Marshall Islands, they have a nuclear club and they've been trying to branch out to um, high schools and middle schools. Yes, yeah, so yeah. there's, there's oh, oh, I don't know if I'm, oh, if I'm back. Okay. <laughs> there are, there is curriculum now like included at the College of the Marshall Islands in the Marshall Islands. Um, but as for, it, it's kind of difficult for us like being like first generation Americans, we hear the stories from our grandparents and our parents sometimes. Um, although it is like survivors are still alive and our grandparents are still alive and we're still going through this now. So it is still very, it's still, ha it feels like people will feel, make it feel like it was a long time ago, but it really wasn't. And the survivors are still here today and we're still sharing stories. So growing up also with an American identity, but also Mercy's identity, I feel like there is a really real clash, identity clash between um, as we're starting to learn the truth. And now it is really like growing up, we are learning like the history of the winners and um, we're kind of like taught to be on this side, but and then we hear the stories from our own families and who are still suffering and are still living the aftermaths today. Um, it is a really weird um, balance between the two, um, but we are working now, like as part of this internship, like we are learning a lot more and I feel like this is like intergenerational healing and we're starting to try to spread the word more to get more of our youth more involved. It is never an easy thing. It's not like a very light topic and it's, it's kind of hard to talk about sometimes, but we do understand the importance to get everyone's involvement. So that is something that we are really working on till this day on island and off island here in the States. Thank you for that question.
Yeah, Christian, if I could just add for just a moment, um, I also really want to thank Helen for this question. And and I think it really, we do really have to turn it around as well. It, it doesn't have to be just about the Marshallese learning about their own history as they absolutely should. But this is part of the U.S. legacy too. This is not ju just because the U.S. went to the Marshall Islands doesn't mean that that's not part of U.S. history. It absolutely is. And it really is a very strong belief of mine that this is something that should be included in um, uh, national, you know, curricula that are used uh, around the country. AP American History has a whole section on the Cold War. Probably many of you even took this class when you were in high school. And there's not one mention of the Marshall Islands. I find that absolutely preposterous. And I think that, um, that, that you know, yes, it is the Marshall Islands legacy, but it's also part of uh, the US history and, and, and needs to be known um, and written about and learned about much more widely than it is uh, uh, today. So thank you. Yes, thank you. And actually, um, booting upon what has just been um, shared, we received a question for both Dr. Ivana Hughes and for Phoenix. The question is, as, as, as experts who have looked at data and research, what types of data do you think we should gather in frontline communities in order to better see the connection between nuclear legacies and climate change? Phoenix, do you want to start? And uh, yeah, that's very interesting because I, I deal a lot with data, data, not necessarily related to nuclear weapons, but for example, I mentioned before toxic sites, uh, just the generic toxic sites. So here in California, we have the Department of Toxic Substance Control and they have uh, an app called EnviroStore and it has the list of all toxic sites in it. And um, as part of my work, we're starting to go through and like examine like where, where did this come from? You know, who started it? Who's responsible for cleaning it up? And how do we address it? And so, you know, I, th I think that we need to have sort of tools like that where we can kind of pinpoint each individual place where like folks have been affected by toxins, by, by nuclear energy, um, by nuclear uh, power, uh, sorry, uh, weapons, and, uh, and start actually addressing this site by site and dealing with this on the local level. I mean, starting from the local level, people working on it, but then networking on a global scale uh, to address it across the world. Yeah, thank you, Phoenix. Let me just add, so in terms of radiation contamination, it's really a very complex question because this is not um, something where, you know, you have, say, a nuclear accident or you have a nuclear weapons explosion test, whatever, and you're just looking at one thing. You're looking at a number of different things. You can have many, many different radioactive isotopes, which can remain in the environment from you know, anywhere from days to hundreds of thousands of years. Um, and so you really have to do very comprehensive um, sort of surveys of what's happening to the environment. And then you're looking at multiple different things. What's the exposure if I just walk around the place? What are the concentrations of these radioactive isotopes in the soil? So if I have a child, so when I'm thinking about resettlement of Bikini Island in the Marshall Islands, I'm not just thinking about, you know, um, a, a tourist on the beach, right? I'm thinking about a family living there, a baby being born, a mother being pregnant and, and living there throughout her pregnancy, uh, a young child playing in the soil, and then, you know, having sort of um, hands that, that might have some soil on and, and putting them on their face in their mouth or whatever. So it's radiation in the soil, it's radiation in the sediment, it's radiation in the water and lots of different types of isotopes. So when we did our studies, we would look at a, a, a few different isotopes and we would look at um, these, uh, the contamination in, from these different sources. And it's very complex. And then we thought we were sort of done with a series of, of measurements. And then we realized that we hadn't looked at one other isotope. And now we want to, we want to really sort of go back and, and start looking at, at that particular isotope from a number of different sources. It's very, very complex. 
The good news is that there is expertise out there, and in particular, following the, the tragedies really of, of Chernobyl and Fukushima, um, and um, a lot of expertise on how you clean things up and what you can do, what you can and cannot do when, when you sort of give up uh, and leave an area uninhabited and when you can actually improve things. And, and part of the problem, and again, I'm speaking about the Marshall Islands specifically, is that a lot of things that could be done or could have been done have not been done the, there yet. Um, and of course, as, as you were asking about this, the data where the radiation sort of is coming or the nuclear weapons issue is coming um, alongside the climate change issue for um, the Marshall Islands, the, the really, the focal point there is this ruined island, um, which Jasmine and Malika talked about, which is storing nuclear waste and yet is threatened by um, uh, global um, sea level rise and, and, and climate change. Um, and that's really one of those places where we're going to have to be very, very, very careful. And I'm not convinced that the job that the U.S. is currently doing in sort of safeguarding uh, that uh, repository is that they are in fact doing a very good job. So there are a lot of, it's, it's a complex thing. It's not just like I go in and I make one measurement. There are just so many things to consider. Um, but thank you, yeah, that's a good, good question too. Thank you. So finally, we have um, a question for um, Runa and Charlotte. So in both your presentations, you talked about how art and design are ways to bridge seemingly separate issues and make these uh, topics concrete. But is it difficult to reach out to experts who may not necessarily know how to work with artists or designers? Um, it's kind of yes and no at the same time. It, it's definitely yes. Uh, it can be difficult to build up the courage sometimes to reach across the divide. Um, but then also I found in particular with the nuclear community, um, a, a welcome hand extended. So I think you have to find your advocate. You have to find um, someone who's more at the table than you are, who believes that your presence has value. And I think you can be surprised by where uh, they can take you if they see value in what you're bringing. So yes, and I think it, it is, is difficult and it requires a lot of mutual respect and patience and trust building. And it's not really a perfect um, art or science. Can I say something? Yes, please, Dina. I think science and art have always um, existed with each other. There's always a correlation between the two. And I think art is something, if you look at it, even as children, we always grew up with art. We, it is, it's something that is natural to us. So it's only when we grow up, we probably do not realize the deep connection we have with art. Because when you draw something as simple as, you know, just putting a signature on your paper, you're already giving a commitment. So art can get you to commit to a lot of things. So you do not need to be an artist to partake in art. So if there's any kind of a program that calls you and tells you that you need to be a part of uh, this growing human flag where if you're gonna have like, you know, like probably a thousand signatures, you're invariably committing to peace and your signature is a form of art. So you really don't need to know art, but you need to be, you know, like open-minded to just join the entire campaign. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm now going to ask if any of the, um, if anyone else has any questions or if any of the um, of our interns at Nuclear Age Peace Foundation would like to ask a question. So, so. Um, maybe I have a question for the attendees. So since I gave you all, I mean, I showed you the entire kind of fashion activism that was done. Would there be any, um, any way that you could probably contribute 
using your form of expression, which is probably not theoretical, you know, not scientific, but something which has an approach to the arts. Is there any way that you guys could probably think of an idea or something of that sort? I think that's an excellent question. Do any of our um, attendees would like to answer that? Because then it's going to make me think that art is a really, really difficult subject and nobody really gets it or it's too simple that nobody even wants to answer it. I, I know that we have one person on the call um, um, who is a, um, works in terms of like creating documents, documentary, like so movies and um, documentaries about like what has been happening in terms of like nuclear disarmament and perhaps um, this person, um, sorry for putting you on the spot, Helen, but if you would like to tackle that question, that would be great to answer it. Yes, well, as uh, Christian said, I um, am a uh, journalist and filmmaker and um, uh, I've been interested in the issue of nuclear weapons for a long time. Uh, and I made a documentary film that follows a group of elderly nuclear disarmament activists who um, engage in very dramatic protest actions at uh, nuclear weapons facilities. Um, and uh, these are plowshares activists. You may have heard of the plowshares movement. And so the film follows their federal cases, that several federal cases. These people undertake these actions in order to raise public awareness. They're, they need to do, they do these actions to do something theatrical and dramatic. So um, this was my particular way of um, doing something about the issue. And um, we have been taking it, before the pandemic, we were taking it to uh, colleges around the country. And uh, what I found was um, many young people uh, who saw the film told me afterwards that they didn't know anything about nuclear weapons. They didn't even know that we still had them. And they, while they were very uh, engaged in the climate issue, they wanted to know what they could do to um, get involved in this. And uh, it was a real eye opener. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, that, that's what I've done artistically for this issue. Definitely, because any form of art always raises awareness. And it's anyways a medley of all kinds of art, right? It could be like filmmaking, it could be writing, it could be sculpture, music. Yeah, thank you so much, Helen. Yes. Hey, Does anyone else? Yes. Hi, this is lovely. I wanted to contribute uh, and provide an answer to Taruna's excellent question. Uh, so just really quickly, my name is Lovely Umayam. I'm the founder of the Bomb Shelter Policy and Arts Collective. Um, and one thing that's been uh, in my mind in the past year is using art books as a way to uh, introduce nuclear policy concepts. So for those who sort of don't know my background. I actually uh, do a lot of creative writing, but also had about 10 years experience in the nuclear non-proliferation field. And one of the things that I've become accustomed to is sifting through a lot of uh, technical government uh, or scientific documents. Uh, and so I've had the opportunity to collaborate with bookmakers specifically to create these stories, these narratives around nuclear topics and using that as a way to introduce uh, potential readers uh, to these kinds of research resources. Um, so that way it's not such a, uh, a difficult, you know, or, or boring thing to do for them to just like unload all of this kind of information, but you ease them, you give them guardrails through art um, and show them that, you know, the, this information is real, this information is accessible, but just being really uh, mindful that for certain audiences who may not necessarily want to be nuclear experts, but care about this issue, that you know, they, they need different entry points uh, to empower them to understand uh, this field. So anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there as an example. Awesome. Yes, um, thank you so much, Lovely. I know that there was an um, answer to your question, Runa, in the um, chat box from um, Sue Kim. Perhaps, um, Sue, if you would like to um, you know, elaborate on what you mentioned.
Yeah, I saw the answer by Sue Kim. Uh, I do agree that words definitely have power and uh, pictography has power too. So you do not have to say too much of words, but then your image, like they say, you know, like an image has the strength of probably an entire page. So I do agree. And thank you so much. Yes, I did take a lot of photographs when I was at the United Nations. And I never knew that these uh, pictures would come off uh, help one day, especially on, at this event. But those were the images that really, really blew my mind because the way they, they were left around in like, you know, like different corners, I had to go by and definitely click them. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. And we have one more question uh, from Doa, who, who is our, um, one of our interns at the um, Nicole H. Peace Foundation. Doa, would you like to um, ask your question to the panelists? Yes, thank you. And thank you for joining me today. Um, your presentations were really interesting and informative. So I have a question about a unique approach to nuclear disarmament. Um, I know that we need a novel approach and that it should be inclusive, it should be intersectional. But I would like to hear from our panelists, why does this inclusive approach, this inter intersectional approach matter in general? Because we have focused on climate today, but what about the intersection of um, nuclear weapons and racism or nuclear weapons and patriarchy? How can we um, sort of address these ideologies which harm our society in conjunct conjunction with um, our fight against nuclear weapons? Mm -hmm. Um, thank you so much for the question. Um, just wondering um, who among our panelists would like to um, answer that. I can speak quite quickly um, to that. I think we've heard from some of the experts on the policy side about the importance of getting the next generation into an issue that in a lot of public um, conversation has been sort of castigated as a problem of the past. Um, in terms of nuclear weapons in particular. Um, and there's good reason to see that intersectional approaches to messaging is a way to highlight how nuclear weapons in particular are relevant and salient to the issues that um, young people or people who are not currently involved in the movement already care about. And to foreground that nuclear weapons, nuclear testing are already a human rights issue, are already an environmental racism issue, is a way to um, link up these challenges in a way that shows a more systematic um, description of the problem, but also highlights the salience, the relevance of uh, the nuclear challenge to issues that maybe feel more proximate and personal and alive, more electric to um, potential participants in the movement. Thank you. Um, anyone, any of our other, other panelists would like to comment? Christian, if, if I may, if we have a moment. Um, so I'll, here I'll paraphrase, not really quote, but paraphrase of a friend of mine, um, Professor Glenn Alcalay. He's an anthropology professor who spent time in the Marshall Islands as a Peace Corps volunteer and then later went um, and did his PhD on the topic of uh, women's health um, as it related to the legacy of the nuclear testing. And, and he likes to say that in terms of what happened in the Marshall Islands, race absolutely played a role um, and was an issue. And so um, I think that as we look at both sort of the history, the present and, and where we go in the future, um, on these issues, race race is a, a constant and it's an undercurrent. And um, I think that you know, for for young activists today who have um, deep passion for social justice issues, uh, this really has to kind of be brought into the the fold of things they care about, um, because related to also things Phoenix was talking about, just toxicity doesn't have to be radiation. You know, how many of us know about uh, communities of color that have been affected? You know, if we're talking just about water contamination in Flint, Michigan, um, there are so many times that, that this has all been so deeply intertwined. And of course, 
uh, the nuclear testing in the Marshall Islands uh, is yet another example. Thank you. Um, if there are no more questions, um, I would like to um, ask our panelists, first of all, thank them for um, taking their time out to present and to engage and ask them if they have any um, concluding remarks that they would like to present. Um, I could like, I would like to say something, but this is a project that is going to be held. If anybody is in the Bay Area in California, we are having a project to do with uh, peace activation. And this is also to do with nuclear disarmament. It's, uh, it's an art project where we've got a wall that's given to us from the city council. Everyone gets uh, a sheet where they can write down what what it means to them to end war. And this flag gets getting, keeps getting stitched every day and it kind of extends for like a week. So if you guys are around, I will let you know the dates and would love to have your participation in this. And especially the NAPF, please do let me know if you'd like to be a part of this agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Any other um, concluding thoughts, remarks? So if not, I would like to thank everyone for um, spending their um, afternoon with us and really you know, engaging in this like, really wonderful conversation. We will continue to have these um, diverse um, events throughout the year. In the fall, we're um, preparing to organize different um, creative events, highlighting an array of subjects as part of our new project called Reverse the Trend, Save Our People, Save Our Planet, which is really focused on amplifying the voices of young people from communities that have been affected by both um, nuclear weapons and climate change. And it's a joint initiative um, carried out by many um, NGOs, including um, bomb shelter, which has been really you know, like a strong you know leader in uh, talking about you know the weapons through um, you know, creative arts and really raising awareness and engaging with both policymakers and activists. On that note, I would like to thank everyone for um, you know really engaging, and I hope that you all have a great rest of the afternoon. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye.